some cadence. Mary told me first thing this morning that she was inspired by the bingo chart that you shared. And so she's done one for her family. Oh, that's great. I love it. It worked this last month for us. So we're trying it again. I love that. I should. I'm sorry. I should welcome everybody here because I didn't do that. But I love that we are able to share from each other's ideas, things that are working for us and and being inspired by each other. I think that's so good. So speaking of um, being inspired by each other, I was inspired by some of you to go ahead and be brave and have that first in-person um, meeting with other like-minded women. And it was so hard. Oh, it was so hard. And I was thinking, I've always acknowledged that it was hard and that that's a scary thing, <laughs> but I was doing it and thinking, okay, you've got to be way more blunt about how hard it is because I, I it might've gone fine. Uh, you know, it might've been just fine, but inside me, I was just all up, all in knots and I'm usually really relaxed and comfortable. Um, I was very uncomfortable. Um, I was so worried about how whatever was being said was received by everybody else. Anytime anyone talked, I was thinking, you know, is this anything negative for anybody? Is it okay? Is everyone okay with this? What are the looks on everybody's faces? I mean, just like, I don't feel that here anymore. And maybe I did and I just don't remember, but Laura was there and was wonderful. Lindsay was there and was wonderful. So that was such a blessing to me to have a couple people there that I knew, you know, we were good. But oh, the rest of it, I just, I was so happy when it was done. <laughs> I just thought, oh, great. Okay, I'm not doing this again. I don't know when I'm going to break that to Lindsay, but I'm not doing this again. <laughs> well, I probably will, but oh, so just wanted to share in case that made anybody feel better. Oh man. And what is it about that? That's so hard. It just feels so vulnerable. Laura, were you going to share something? You reached forward. So okay. hoping my, I just came home with donuts and told the kids they couldn't have them until the house is clean. And my four-year-old's having a hard time with that. So I hope you guys don't <laughs> make a meltdown, but um, I was just going to say it was so good. And I know we're probably so nervous that it was hard to see. I think people that this was a brand new idea, I think their hearts are just relieved that there's other people wanting to share the same ideas as they are. And I think it, I think it was very good. I think you did a good job. I don't think anybody else, if, if you weren't saying how nervous you were, I wouldn't have any idea. So you did an excellent job and it was a very, wow. so good job. Good job gathering women together. That is part. You did it and you did a good job and it was a lovely evening. So, oh, okay. That, you know what? It's super interesting. So this would be another thing to share. I would have sworn that everybody was like feeling sorry for me because I was such a mess, so worried, so nervous, just stumbling all over the place. And just because they're my friends, they were kind. So I think that, so that's crazy that you think it was well good and that you couldn't tell. Um, not that you're crazy. So being very careful about, you know, what we say and what, what we're, what we meant. Um, but I, that's hard for me to believe. So, so look at that. What does that tell you, right? All these times that you are second guessing what you're doing and you're feeling so like, oh my gosh, I was such a failure. Laura, you're, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say again, it was, and there were people there that weren't your friends, like you'd never met before, right? Mm -hmm. Several people were there that we didn't know. And um, it was so good. I think that they, um, like I said, were so many people, souls are just hungering for like-minded women to meet together. And 
it was good to meet everybody and to hear their background and to hear their story and what bring, because they all had a different story of why they were wanting to gather together and find other women who share the same desire to learn and to grow and to warm our hearts and to gain knowledge of good things, not just things that are going on in the world. So it was very good. Okay. Very interesting because I still this morning was just like, I'm, I told my daughter, Sarah, I'm serious. I'm, you've got to hold me to this. I'm not doing this again. I don't want to, somebody else is going to have to do it because I'm out. I'm done. (laughs) So, wow. That's just, you know, that's crazy. Um, Okay. Linnell asked, how did I, how did we structure the meeting? What did you talk about? I don't know. I was so nervous. I don't know. You'll have to ask Laura. What did we talk about? I don't know. I can't feel as I would try to write things down and decide what are we going to do? What are we going to talk about? I had sent them the intro, right? Marlene's kind of invitation and introduction, that page. And so I don't know if they did or did not do that. But um, some of them did, I know from their comments, and some of them even went on and did section one. Um, we assigned section one for this next month, and then we'll get together the last Thursday of this month. And um, and then uh, we'll, you know, kind of talk about that. And um, we did extend the invitation for others to take turns hosting. What was told when I was asking Marley about it, she said, you need to have one consistent facilitator. So, um, but you can uh, rotate houses, but you should probably do it in that first place for two or three times to kind of establish this is how it's going. This is what we're doing. So it doesn't flip immediately into a book club or, a, you know, something different. Um, so that was that was helpful. Um, but that's probably why I'm no, no. Anyway, so Laura, can you help by Laura and Bennett? Can you share about last night and um, what it was we actually talked about? I know that's a little hard with Bennett, but he's so cute. You say, hey, hi, everybody can see you. Hi, Bennett. Um, so there really wasn't a whole lot of structure. I think you had a, like a picture prepared to share and a couple quotes and um, had everybody introduce themselves, which was yeah. neat to kind of get to know everybody's background and coming from, Ricky. sorry, and um, I don't know. And then you and Lindsay shared, you know, how much you love the program and kind of your testimony about it and then had me share. (laughs) Um, But I think it kind of led itself with other people, you know, sharing their feelings of what they had, um, what brought them. Like, so we had a lady share um about her experience with adoption and her family and how um she had gone on and just watched a couple of the first videos and how just that much had changed her perspective on mothering and her experience with this little boy that they have adopted and is in their home and and it was just wonderful to hear and we had a couple other people share um their life stories that we wouldn't have known that I think brought us together and kind of united us even more in our purpose. So I thought it was very spirit led. Okay. I appreciate that. I, um, I don't, I, I'm not fishing for more positive like input about, you know, but, but wow, that is very, very helpful to me because I, I interpreted it very differently. So isn't that interesting Um, how that negative (laughs) gets in your head and you just think, okay. So Chris got my neighbor who I have done the, her and I, when the new introduction course came out, her and I went through it together. 
Um, but we haven't really done much together since then. Sorry. Um, and um, it was good to have that refresher. And then she also came away just, she was the only one that's not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but she still felt included and loved, loved, loved being with like women. So it oh, was good. So Okay, good. That's so great. Okay, that's so good. I'm relieved. Um, okay, here's a quote I'm going to share that we shared. Um, Lindsay talked about the um, mother's love works magic and organi organized mother love works miracles for humanity, um, which is powerful to think about that. And yes, we're talking about Catch the Vision course. So the introduction and then doing the six sections of the Catch the Vision course over the six months. So that's all that we're putting out there. We're going to meet for six months. We're going to each be doing the um, a section a month of Catch the Vision and then getting together and talking about, you know, what we learned from it, how it blessed us. And the one mom that was sharing that Laura talked about, um, it was the Gordon Newfield video about um, about attachment and that was the thing that brought her this incredible amount of comfort um and that was that was beautiful to hear that and then this quote we found when we were on our little um jaunt to the um, forest lawn memorial park and we loved it i don't remember if we shared it last week but i'm gonna share it again if we did and this was calvin coolidge so maybe we did share it um, if we could surround ourselves with forms of beauty, so I like to read a couple times so we get it. If we could surround ourselves with forms of beauty, which is what we're all trying to do, the evil things of life would tend to disappear. Well, that's pretty amazing and wonderful. You want the evil things of life to disappear? Well, surround yourself with forms of beauty and our moral standards standards would be raised through our contact with the beautiful we see more of the truth and are brought into closer contact with the infinite through our contact with the beautiful we see more of the truth and are brought into closer contact with the infinite and yeah, while somebody else is talking, I will type that into the chat. It is carved into one of the walls in the mausoleum at um, Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. If you ever are in Los Angeles, I will meet you there. I will take you and show you the things that Oh, that I just loved that we're there. It was beautiful. Or if you don't want to go with me, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll get over that. But go and see um, the beautiful, incredible, inspiring things that are there. And if you'd love to read an inspiring biography, I highly recommend First Step Up Toward Heaven. That's the title. It's on Internet Archive. I'm going to type it up right here. It might be noisy. I'm, I apologize. Um, so, like I said, it's available on Internet Archive. Oh. Um, I went back to read it again a little bit, and it's been it's been uh, being borrowed several of the times I tried, but I had just. Um, talked to Marlene a couple nights ago and told her about it. And she said, oh, I'm going to get it right now and I'm going to read it. So she's probably reading it until she's done. It was beautiful. It's so inspiring. So that is the biography of Hubert Eaton. And he is the man who had this vision, this inspiration from heaven to change how cemeteries are. We read to you. Oh, I don't know if we read to you. Okay, we'll need, to, I need to do that. Um, and anyone can share in the meantime, but I'm going to look up the Builder's Creed. And I think Lindsay shared with you last week, but I'm not sure. Um, she mentioned it, but I don't think that she read it when I lost my computer 
access and everything. Um, but we walked up to the mausoleum outside of the mausoleum and it was just this beautiful building, incredibly beautiful arch right there next to it. And just, it was absolutely incredible. Um, but, uh, so, so this man, Hubert Eaton, he, he, uh, had just been in a situation where he was doing so well financially, making a lot of money and it just, it just disappeared. I mean, he, he had a mine, a silver mine and this really rich, wonderful streak in this mine. And he had had it double checked with other experts. And they said, yeah, this is, this is great. Go for it. And so he was, and things were going really well and they're mining, mining, mining all of a sudden that streak just stopped. It just ended. And he had a, a man who's an expert in the field, ha had made a lot of money in mining, back him and say, yeah, let's all, all put up the money, the funds to go to explore and, and find where this streak starts up again. Cause uh, you know, it's got to from the looks of it and everything. And so he spent $75,000 backing him to look didn't come up with anything did it again another seventy five thousand dollars and this is back um when late 1800s early 1900s oh, somewhere in there um nothing so it just ended and so here he is completely without a job and money needs to pay people back that backed him for this and everything have runs into goes to visit a friend this friend is a banker i think and the guy just had a letter across his desk telling him about this position that's open to manage a cemetery out in california he's never done anything like that before but he thought well i'll respond to this and just see he goes out there and he's standing looking around the grounds i'll just share this little part with you um nine oh, well this is not even january 1st 1913 or something i think it was i don't think it's gonna tell me 1916 <sighs> something like that um he stood on a hillside that overlooked a small 50 acre country cemetery which he managed only a few of the acres were developed a small patch of lawn and a few straggling headstones which were surrounded by unkempt brown hillsides there were no buildings on the property it was to be blunt quite unsightly it was then that he realized something had to be done um the cemetery under his care could and should be something very different from what he was seeing and he had this this doesn't say that but in the book it tells he had this kind of vision of what it, what could happen what could be done he went home, sat down at his desk in his study and put his thoughts, oh, it does say here, sorry, his vision actually, in writing. When he was finished, his words, which we today know as the Builder's Creed, provided an eloquent yet passionate guide for what this cemetery should be. So, of course, they're not telling me right here what that is. Okay, hold on, I gotta look again. Um, I was really touched by the fact that um, in throughout the whole biography, God was very involved in in the whole thing. Um, okay, okay, okay. Well, that is not as clear as I want it to be. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is what we go and stand in front of this huge, like. I don't know what it would a plaque kind of, but it's not a plaque because it's the whole wall, but it's this giant piece of stone and in it is carved this message. It's huge as you stand in front of it. And I stood and read it and then I just a tear streaming down my face as I'm reading and I come to the end of this and I'll, I'll read it to you, but it is signed the builder. His name is not on it. He didn't put his own name. He just put the builder. And I think that's beautiful uh, anyway, but somebody else below it has a plaque telling about him, you know, who it was that did this and everything. But this is what he said. I believe in a happy eternal life. I believe those of us who are left behind should be glad in the certain belief that those gone before who believed in him have entered into that happier life. I believe most of all in a Christ that smiles and loves you and me. I therefore know the cemeteries of today are wrong because they depict an end, not a beginning. They have consequently become unsightly stone yards full of inartistic symbols and depressing customs. 
places that do nothing for humanity save a practical act and not that well. I therefore prayerfully resolve on this New Year's Day 1917 that I shall endeavor to build Forest Lawn as different, as unlike other cemeteries as sunshine is to darkness. As eternal life is unlike death, I shall try to build at Forest Lawn a great park, devoid of misshapen monuments and other customary signs of earthly death, but filled with towering trees, sweeping lawns, splashing fountains, singing birds, beautiful statuary, cheerful flowers, noble memorial architecture with interiors full of light and color, and redolent of the world's best history and romances. I believe these things educate and uplift a community. Forest Lawn shall become a place where lovers, new and old, shall love to stroll and watch the sunsets glow, planning for the future or reminiscing of the past. A place where artists study and sketch, where school teachers bring happy children to see things they read of in books, where little churches triumphant in the knowledge that from their pulpits only words of love can be spoken, where memorialization of loved ones in sculptured marble and pictorial glass shall be encouraged but controlled by acknowledged artists a place where the sorrowing will be soothed and strengthened because it will be god's garden a place that shall be protected by an immense endowment care fund the principal of which can never be expended only the income therefrom used to care for and perpetuate this garden of memory this is the builder's dream. This is the builder's creed. Signed, the builder. And that's, that is, that's what it looks like. I just loved it. And then he goes on this quest to make this place different than any, but any other cemeteries have ever been and calls it a memorial park. And the people on the board, you know, just think he's nuts. And he fights against opposition all through the years that he ran this and he and his wife he meets this woman who is incredible and understands his dream and has this eye for art not not trained necessarily in that but has this incredible eye for art and and over time is recognized for that and um, they go to different countries looking for art to bring back and have in the in the place there. I mean, just incredible stories throughout um, the building of this whole cemetery. They have they have reproductions of statuary that you know of either from reading about it or maybe you've traveled to Europe and seen some of these things in person. But there are reproductions there. The um the thing that drew us there initially is the reproduction of da vinci's last supper he they went to italy saw it were so saddened by its condition because of the nature of the um painting on the wall and all of that and then the lack of care over some of the years but um he thought there should be a reproduction we should be able to always see this and so he went to uh, found out about this family in Italy that were glass stained glass artists and there was one person left in the family who still knew the trade and went to her and asked her if she if there was any way that she would be willing to do this and she said oh this has been my dream and my father's before me but it's such a big project we could never do it without it being commissioned and they had even kind of worked out the panels and how it would all be but never were able to do it. So I thought that was a cool story, just that um, in and of itself. But anyway, um, it was made, I think it took six or seven years to make, and then it was carefully packaged up and pieces and then sent to California, unpackaged, installed, and it's incredible. It's huge, and it is so moving and so beautiful. And you sit on these little benches in this huge, gorgeous hallway and hear about the story of this incredible um, stained glass reproduction of Da Vinci's Last Supper. It was incredible. I was a lot of talking on my part. <laughs> I apologize. I will now type up the quote that I promised and let you share anything that you've been thinking of or things you're 
I don't know your feelings about that or things that you came to share today. Um, I can share something. I was, I checked out this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the safety kids. It's not my listen to as a kid. Um, but I checked out this one from the library for my kids to listen to. It's not one I was familiar with. And the very last song, because it's, uh, it's teaching kids about different things. And this one's called Make the World Beautiful. And I, when you were reading your quote about the beautiful world, I, this came to me. So the words are make the world beautiful for kids like me, for kids like us, for kids you see. Need a great big beautiful world to grow. Make the world beautiful while we are small. While we grow up, then we can all have a great big beautiful life we know. Make the world wonderful, marvelous, everything fine. Because if it's wonderful, marvelous, how we kids will shine. So make the world beautiful where kids can thrive, where innocence can stay alive. For without kids, there's no way the world can grow. If you love us, show you do. Take care of us. We need you. Make for us a world that's safe from the things that hurt us. Don't leave it all up to us. We need someone we can trust. Help us find a happy place. Love us. Don't desert us. Once the world is beautiful, just like a dream, make it stay that way. Help keep it clean. Give us beauty, give us light, everything that's good and right, all that's beautiful and true, that's all we ask of you. So, and of course the, the kids are on the recording, the kids are singing the song and I don't remember the tune, but I thought it was really cool. Let's see, how can I post the poem? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'm just on my phone, so it's harder to type it all up. Um, is there a certain place you'd like me to post it? <laughs> Or take a, I don't know, take a picture of it and post it in the Facebook group. Do you want me to do that? Does that work? Okay. My, my daughter, we've been reading the Arabian Night story, so she decided to dress up today. She's got... I got blankets. three blankets on me. Sorry, she, oh, I don't know if you can hear her. She can't hear you, but... She says, I've got three blankets on me. So she's got one around her head. She's so cute. I love it. One wrapped around her. <laughs> okay. Quote is there. Thanks, Mary, for sharing that. That's lovely. And it does go along with that. Well, the, the, the topic of this book was, was actually pornography and how to keep kids safe from it. And so I checked it out thinking that's probably what it was on and I'm like I don't know how to dress that with my kids yet <laughs> so I just put the cd on I'm like this is really good stuff um so I checked it out for one more week <laughs> yeah I love that I you know I had a thought when I was at the um oh, where was I had the Huntington going through the galleries and the art because I had just had an interaction with someone who had been to the Getty they came back from the Getty and all of those beautiful, incredible things that they saw. And the comment was, um, I was so uncomfortable with all the nudity. And I thought, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was kind of an, uh, I am so like I would almost consider myself a prude in a lot of areas, but not in art. And I don't, I do, I have seen things where there is unnecessary, you know, over the top um, nudity, but I think it is so beautiful. And I am touched by so much of that, that I thought, oh, I wonder, I, I just wonder what the, what the foundation was there, you know, what the background was and, and why I don't, I don't mean, I don't care beyond that, but you know, why, why that person would be so uncomfortable and I am not. Um, and I thought I, I loved sharing appropriate uh, pieces of art with my children I think as a foundation for this is beautiful, you know, this is Heavenly Father's creation and it's beautiful. And, and then perhaps when we would ha later have the discussions of the evils, you know, in pornography and things like that, you could have this contrast. Um, 
and I would much rather find that my child had been so curious that they pulled the art book off the shelf then somehow ran across something else you know I mean and that's a whole topic for you know another day and maybe maybe not this group you know and um but anyway but I just thought that was kind of interesting it, it's this idea of Satan twisting things that are good to be evil and evil to be good and and wow that goes uh, through so many different areas of life, probably every area of life. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, anyway, we got to see a, a replica, a reproduction. Like I said last week, I don't know what the difference is, but of the David, uh, life size, um, done in marble now because of the one, excuse me, done in bronze, bronze. Yeah, because the marble one had fallen twice and broken. So, but it's just these incredible things. There was a statue there of George Washington. We didn't see it. I'm going back. Um, there are two huge art pieces that um, the building was closed. You have to be very careful to be aware of the timing of that. But there is a building that was built to house this piece of art that he found after years of searching for, because he felt like the uh, this place needed to be focused on Christ and um, eternal life, and they needed to have the Last Supper, the crucifixion, and the resurrection somehow portrayed there. And when he finally found the picture of the crucifixion that he wanted, it that picture is 95 feet wide and 35 feet high it's huge and so he had to have a building built in order to show it properly and i can hardly wait to get to go and see that and experience that and then there's another very large maybe equally large i don't I don't know. I haven't been there. I haven't seen it. I just know it's there of the resurrection. I mean, and he went on a search for the smiling Jesus because all the art that he was finding was not a smiling Jesus or was a very weak Jesus. And he thought those, that's not my, that's not the savior that I know. And that's not the one who called the children to him. I mean, there just, there, there needs to be. And so he just kept looking until he finally found what he wanted. Anyway. It's just incredible. And the feeling that's there, it's beautiful. You feel the spirit there. Anyway, it was just a really neat experience to be there and see, to know about the history of it and a little bit and then experience it and then come home and read his life story, basically, <laughs> and the creation of this place, what went into it. It's it's quite beautiful. And even just history and time, he would speak to these businessmen conferences, you know, back in the day. And he would talk about Christ in business and how you model things. After, I mean, things that are so out of, I mean, you could not talk about these things today. And that was a topic. If, and they were all, all these people that were there were fine with that topic, supportive of that topic. Anyway, just you kind of forget that things were different before. Anyway, I just have a lot of that still rolling around in my head. Okay, it's March. It's a new month, new topics, all kinds of new things to be filling your heart with. I wonder how you're doing, how you're feeling about you. Because a lot of times we do pretty great with our kids. You know, we have our ups and downs. We have our, you know, we perceived failures, which really aren't. We have our, our successes, the cool things we do that we could, you know, share and help hopefully inspire other people. But how about with you? How are you doing with that? Anybody having some successes or some failures that you want to share that we could learn from or help each other with? This month is imagination. How do you do with that topic? Can you imagine that you're an amazing, incredible woman? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, Mercedes, go. 
Um, this is not to do with imagination, but uh, I was super struck by Melanie saying that she was listening to Story of Liberty as she drove down to get her harp that she posted on the Marco Polo. And so I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. So I just was kind of like, oh, I want to sit and read one day. And so I just pulled it up. I, it took me a while to find it because it's in month 11 to find the PDF, but um, or maybe 12. But um, and so it took me a while to find it. But once I did, I was just astounded. And so I started reading it. And I was just, I love how, is it Coffin or Caffin? Whatever his name is, Charles, the author how he weaves together these events that don't seem like they even go together, like that there's no tying to them together, but he connects them in the name of, you know, the progression of civilization towards liberty. And I have just been fascinated reading this book. I've done so many notebook pages on it already, like all these people I'm putting into my timeline. And I just feel like that's been really amazing because I feel like as we're always talking about that the giving up of liberty is what we're seeing around us right now. People don't care anymore. They just want to be safe or protected or not have to worry about the work that goes with it, that it seems to be failing. And so to look at the past and how like the, the awful, horrible things that happened to people, because that was what they wanted, because that was their dream. That was what they knew that God intended for man has been just this beautiful eye-opening experience. And so I wanted to thank, I think she's on here today. I wanted to thank um, Melanie for saying that because I didn't even know that the book existed. <laughs> so so I love that. I love you were inspired by one of your friends. Mm -hmm. I think that's so beautiful. Tell us the book again. What is the book? It's, it's Story of Liberty. Okay. The audio on Belmond is in, I think February's month six. But the actual PDF of the book is in month 11 or 12. I can't remember which. I think 11. So it took me like ages to find the PDF. But I, because I, I prefer to read rather than to listen. Story of Liberty. That's fabulous. I love yeah. that. And you can feel, we can feel your enthusiasm about what you read and what you <laughs> learned, what you got from it. And that's another just, that is what happens. It's that little bit of, you know, magic that happens mm -hmm. as we warm our hearts and we get inspired by those things. I love it. Thanks for sharing that Mercedes. And thanks Melanie for sharing with the group so that Mercedes could be inspired. And now I want to read that. So I star by that note. So I don't forget. Okay. Anybody else? Your experiences with your own something you've learned. It can be the tiniest thing. I'll share something. Hi, Melanie. So first of all, I love that um, you picked that up and started reading because um, I've really enjoyed that story as well. Um, so I just, I think it was uh, yesterday I opened an email, uh, the Amazon first reads. I don't know if any of you guys get that, but you can get like one free book. And I usually choose like the children's book. <laughs> because it's one of the only ones that seems acceptable. But occasionally I get like the historical fiction and I usually never read them. But this time, um, I, th I think it's under the historical fiction genre. It just sounded so fascinating that I actually just wanted to start reading it instantly. And so I started reading it yesterday. Um, and it's about this woman and I, I believe it's based on a true story, um, but she's during the revolutionary time and um, she just wants to, you know, be active and do things that at that time, you know, only boys were allowed to do. And I understand that at some point in the story, she's, it's, it seems like she's supposed to go off and fight pretending that she's a man. So there's, you know, some kind of, I don't think that it has the kind of agenda that you'd think it would have these days, but um, there's, there's some kind of undertones of, you know, girl power doing the things that, um, you know, your hearts are drawing you to do regardless of your culture, um, but also the, some of the, the context of the day of what she, how she kind of felt oppressed. But um, anyway, what I was going to share actually was undertones also of, of liberty. Sorry, I'm getting a call here. Um, 
and the the people that were around her were all in this fervor you know towards towards fighting off the british and and wanting to fight for liberty and there was one particular line um that just got me thinking um it says and many many wonder what it's all for all this fighting I wonder what it's all for. And yet the truth, the truth of the ages is that it's not for ourselves that we act. It's not for our lives we're building, but the lives of generations that will come. Um, and I think because America is struggling right now, I feel to maintain our liberties. And like Mercedes was just saying, you know, people are kind of getting lackadaisical about about the value of that. Um, I have sometimes looked back at the revolutionary times and thought, you know, they they fought for it and then they got to enjoy it at, at its kind of most purest form before before more laws and more laws and more laws changed. And you know, people um, have kind of forgotten the value of what their forefathers have fought for and things have changed over time. Um, but I don't know, just reading the book helped me realize like that generation didn't even, and, and, and it says in there, you know, that that generation and maybe even the next generation didn't get to enjoy it as much as they felt the following generation would get to start truly enjoying the freedoms and that they really were sacrificing so much that they weren't even going to enjoy the fruits of and how selfless that is. And, you know, are we willing to do what it takes in our time that may not take fruit for another 150 years? Um, and, and maybe it will be our great, great grandkids that really get to benefit from the shifts that we help influence in our family line and in the areas around us and in the culture. So it just got me thinking more about <laughs> what kind of influence am I creating that will actually take a ripple effect and make and make a difference for generations down my own line? Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. And I think that really has, I don't know, it says a lot about the possibility, the opportunity a mother has. I and mean, that's why we talk about that, about a mother having this opportunity to influence um, the importance of, of a woman in, um, civilization, actually that quote that Marlene shared today was pretty powerful. I went back and I read the article and I thought, Ooh, there'd be a lot of people that would, you know, be a little bit uncomfortable with this. I love it, but I'm, you know, from, I don't know, 200 years ago, I don't know. I have weird ideals, but, um, but I think it's, I think it's right. It's just that, sometimes culture will twist even that that right true you know those principles but this idea that woman mother forms society is powerful so what are we going to do about it and sure there are things all around us where it's tweaked and changed and everything but i love that we still have a lot of influence and again what are we going to do with it i think this idea of warming our hearts nurturing our hearts learning these stories being inspired by these stories and then finding out okay god what what do you want me to do about it did do you do you read from here this is which one is this? Is it book three? Volume three, Inspiration. It's the, what are these called? I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. I can't remember anything. Anyway, but it's the Catch the Vision. Oh, reference books. Reference library. So volume three there. Um, month seven from the podcasts. I remember reading this to my husband and he loved it. He was impressed with it. Um, it's talking about the writings of Charles Eastman. He was the first Native American to write an autobiography and to talk of their way of life 
from a first person point of view. Uh, trying to, I don't want to read the whole thing. Um, his grandmother's name was Stan's Sacred, and she was strong and brave. At one point, she had to swim across a river with him on her back. As we are always on the lookout for lessons on being better mothers, let me share some of his thoughts about the role of mother and grandmother in his culture. So this is from him. It has been said that the position of woman is the test of civilization. That's super interesting. How the people view woman. Okay, so the position and what position they put her in. The position of woman is the test of civilization. And that of our women was secure. In them was vested our standard of morals and the purity of our blood. She, she being woman, was to us a tower of moral and spiritual strength until the coming of the border white man, the soldier and traitor, who with strong drink overthrew the honor of the man and through his power over a worthless husband, purchased the virtue of his wife or his daughter. When she fell, the whole race fell with her. Before this calamity came upon us, you could not find anywhere a happier home. I'm not talking about the whole issue. I'm talking about women and their position. You could not find anywhere a happier home than that created by the Indian woman. Her early and consistent training, the defi definiteness of her vocation and above all her profoundly religious attitude gave her a strength and poise that could not be overcome by ordinary misfortune. Wouldn't that be a lovely thing to feel or be aware that that was a description of you? Your profoundly religious attitude gave you a strength and poise that could not be overcome by ordinary misfortune. That's pretty powerful. A woman's name usually suggested something about the home, often with the adjective pretty or good and a feminine termination, feminine, feminine ending for that word. The American Indian was an individualist. He had neither a national army nor an organized church. There was no priest to assume responsibility for another soul. That is, we believed the supreme duty of the parent, since it is his creative and protecting power which alone approaches the solemn function of deity. The Indian was a religious man from his mother's womb, from the moment of her recognition of the fact of conception to the end of the second year of life, it was supposed by us that the mother's spiritual influence counted for most. Her attitude and secret meditations must be such as to instill into the receptive soul of the unborn child the love of the great mystery, that's in quotation marks, and a sense of brotherhood with all creatures. Um, it talks about silence and isolation being the rule of life for the expectant mother. She wanders prayerfully in the stillness of the great woods. Don't you all do that when you're um, pregnant, carrying your child? Wander prayerfully in the stillness of the great woods. But it sounds like a pretty great approach to that, doesn't it? Wouldn't that kind of help you be a little more prepared? Um, oh, anyway, it goes on. It's worth reading. I, I would definitely read it, but I, I love this. And it says, the old are dedicated to the service of the young as their teachers and advisors, and the young in turn regard them with love and reverence. That fits into that whole peer, um, uh, ver the opposite of the peer attachment, you know, attaching to your elders, to the people. Around. Anyway, I just love it. I that were pretty powerful to think about not what you hear and see, which really is a small portion of what is really out there, but what you know to be truth. <laughs> so cute. Very sleepy. Very sleepy girl. It's good to see your face. So sitting with mama. I love that. Anyway, other thoughts, other things you brought with you? I'll share. Good. Um, so I have a 14 year old who's very hard to sway into certain books that, you know, I'd prefer that she read. And so 
she has been trying to get me to read her book. And so I finally gave in and her fancy right now, she's been through a lot of things, Greek mythology, like when she gets into something, it's very passionate. And um, right now it's the romance stories on Deseret Bookshelf. And so, you know, to me, it's like, come on, let's read something better. But I finally conceded and listened to one of her stories while we sat and did a puzzle while it was raining outside and it was just lovely. But the story, they're very clean, very pure, very um, sweet romance stories. And, um, but it's, you know, 1800s talks about the enjoying the arts, the going to Paris or enjoying the art there and the people and um, having tea time and taking time to paint and taking time to go and enjoy nature and all these things that, and then the romance side of it has just made me like put words to the feelings that I feel towards my husband. So now I'm just like, ah, oh, I just love him so much. And, but it's just been so sweet to be in her world a little bit and to, you know, remember those teenage romance years of, you know, dreaming about love. And, um, and it's been so good for my heart right now, I think I needed to see her world a little bit. And so much more lighthearted than um, the thing that Melanie shared, but I just wanted to say that I all, I very much appreciate that thought, Melanie, that um, the work that we're doing and the things that we're changing are going to affect our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and who knows who in our community it will affect. We, um, I know I shared with you guys when I was, um, actually a lot of you weren't there, but a few, actually it's been over a year. I did, um, we were going on a family history trip and church history trip. And we did, we, Family Search has made it so easy to find our own family history stories and stories that my husband and I did not know. We weren't aware of our parents had not shared stories of our grandparents with us. That's just, you know, we that's not culturally, we're not told their stories anymore. And my parents didn't even know their stories. And my husband's parents did not know their stories. But because of family search, because of the internet, we've been able to learn their stories because other people had journals or whatever that they had found. And learning their stories, our great, great, great grandparents stories have changed us so much. And so to think that the work that we're doing will affect our great, great grandchildren is, it's amazing. It's so, it makes it so much more worth it. So thank you for sharing that. And on a lighthearted note, sometimes learning and doing the things that our children are doing can be heartwarming. Anyway, it's been good for me. <laughs> it's so fun. So fun to meet my daughter where she's at right now. So Okay. Laura, I'm so glad you acknowledged Melanie's comments because I meant to do that in my rambling after she spoke because as she was talking, I thought about this little, it's a proverb that is um, attached to different cultures, different, you know, different countries. Um, but this is one version of it. These trees, which he plants and under whose shade he shall never sit. He loves them for themselves and for the sake of his children and his children's children who are to sit beneath the shadow of their spreading boughs. And other versions are blessed are old people who plant trees, knowing that they shall never sit in the shade of their foliage. So it's that kind of an idea. You're doing this work that you're never going to experience the full fruit of, but it blesses those who come after. And I've always loved that idea. So thanks for sharing that. Okay. I, again, I apologize for talking so much this time. I'm still, like I said, so filled 
with this awe and excitement and I don't appreciation for the experience I had seeing Forest Lawn, reading about Hubert Eaton, that first step up toward heaven, which again, I highly uh, endorse, recommend, whatever. But I've, I've loved this discussion as well. The little bits you guys have been able to contribute in between all my talking. So thank you for granting me that today. I think it's more nervousness left over from last night than anything else. But if anyone else has something they would like to share before we go, we would love to hear that. And then we'll turn it over to Linnell. Um, I want to share, we, um, we just finished reading Mother Carrie's Chickens. And I just loved it so much. Of course, there was like, you know, it's an old book. So there's little things here and there that's like, well, we don't feel that way now. And, and you know, you just skip over them. <clears throat> um, just talking about the people, you know, anyway, I have to say that because sometimes there's little things and it, you just overlook them. Um, but I loved, I just loved who she was, that she was just so loved by everyone around her. And I, I kept trying to figure out why she was so loved and why everyone was so it, it was like she was like mag she was like a magnet for people and she would just love them and bring them under her wings I guess and I just love that idea and I and I don't even know where I'm going with this but I just felt so inspired and I did feel a little bit of the oh I am nowhere close to that I really you know like when you're looking up a mountain like that's where I want to get someday you know <laughs> Uh, but for the most part, I just felt really inspired. And so I wanted to share something after I was notebooking, we'd finished and it was like 11 o'clock, 1130. And that's late for me <laughs> on a school night. And I just wanted to notebook everything I could that I loved and remembered about the story. Otherwise we're going to move on and I'm not going to get it down. When you first shared what your trial was going to have to be of sending your children back when you wanted to keep them home, I thought, oh my goodness, that would be one of the hardest things for Heavenly Father to ask me to do. And so I pray for you and my heart goes out to you because that is such a hard thing to do. And you are doing it so beautifully. I, I just think what a blessing your children have to have you as a mom. And I know you're not perfect. I know that you do things that sometimes you think, ah, oh, I, <laughs> I wish I wouldn't do that. You know, we do, we, Laura and Lindsay and I were, we planned to go to the temple yesterday morning, early, early. We were going to leave at 4.30, which is nuts, but it's, it's a two hour drive for us. And um, about, we couldn't get through roads. And so we had breakfast instead. And then we just visited and we were talking about this, this idea of, you know, you see the negative so clearly, you see the mistakes and they're big and glaring. And I one time, I think I've mentioned this before, but talking to one of my sisters-in-law, she was talking about that and she was praying about it and feeling so guilty for these moments that, you know, she had not been the ideal. And, um, and the answer she got, the little thing to think about was, you're looking at your timeline and you're seeing these, these close-ups, like these under a microscope moments of your life. That is not me. I am not showing you that. I am not focused on those. You need to put those aside. Those are coming from somebody else, from somewhere else. So that was huge and it's such a good thing to remember that he's not going to focus on those things he's going to focus on the good and the beautiful things that you're doing so i love that remember um it really is through those small and simple things that great things are brought to pass so if you have a moment i don't care how small it is but if you have a moment where you were that model sweet gentle kind loving mother with arms outstretched for all her little chickens, you know, then applaud it, notice it, recognize it, applaud it, write it down, because we need to hang on to those. It's not an easy work that we do. My cute son-in-law, 
had the baby for good parts of a day and a half because um, his wife had some things she needed to go my my daughter had some things she needed to go and take care of and do and and ever since then he has just been so good at sharing comments with her about how hard it would be to do that every single day 24 hours a day knowing that is your calling and responsibility as adorable as that baby is and as good as he is it's still hard being a mother is hard it's a lot of work it doesn't matter how cute and amazing and wonderful your children are or how much you love them it's it's a hard work so notice the good things that you do please notice those things and know that when you're seeing the bad so very strong and in your face it's it's satan trying to put those things under the microscope so they look much bigger than they are in the whole eternal scheme of things well now several of you have shared um people who inspire you or um things you've read read that have inspired you and today i feel inspired by all of you and your experiences and your efforts and your examples are like a light kind of um Lori, do you have that picture that you share with us next to you the little homes that are lit and that are sharing their lives and i think it's inspiring to meet with you and to share what you're overcoming and what you're learning and how you're sharing your light today is girls day in Japan, they celebrate March 3rd as Girls' Day. And May 5th is Boys' Day. And it's easy to remember because 3-3 is girl and girls and 5-5, five, five, um, May 5th and, and March 3rd. So um, growing up in Hawaii, there are a lot of Japanese cultural influence there. And so there's a lot more celebration in Hawaii. But what I've carried on in my family is we make mochi. And on Girls' Day, we make pink mochi. And on Boys' Day, we make blue mochi. And so I've been thinking because I made mochi while we were uh, on the call and I am listening to everyone sharing comments about the influence of a woman and how essential women are in the success of our nation, in the success of our homes and families as well. And what I've been thinking a lot about ever since Marlene shared it, she shared on the Mighty Networks about the developing the habit of attention and I've really been thinking about that a lot and what that means. And so just for those who haven't read it or seen it, she says, um, John Muir Laws teaches that love is really sustained attention. Love is sustained attention. And she has learned that many people refer to um, the habit of attention. So a world of infinite beauty and discovery awaits, no waits just beyond the point where we usually stop paying attention. Train your mind and the world will offer you its secrets of wonder and beauty. And then also um, the purpose, the main purpose of Hebrew education was to form habits of attention. And that when these had once been secured, the pupil would be capable of mastering any subject that divine providence should put before him. And I think that is such a beautiful and great work that we are participating in that we are helping our children expand their habit of attention, to increase their habit of attention, to allow for more and to be thoughtful and observant and to notice those things so that they can be prepared to receive anything that divine providence gives them. I think that's powerful and I think that's inspiring. And I think that's a great work that we're all part of that through the arts, we can help our children to develop that habit and that gift. Thanks, Linnell, I really appreciate that. And that was really beautiful. I loved that whole thing on attention. I keep going back and reading that to see what else is in there for me. What other applications? Uh, for those of us who um, know this scripture or this phrase, which I, it's all of us here, but the idea of um, leaving your burdens at the feet of the Savior, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. 
I know I'm going over and I'm sorry. Um, but this idea of light, thinking of light in all the different applications, light as in weight, right? But what if it's light as in illuminating, um, light as in burning and refining? Um, there's just different ways to think about that. And that has been on my mind a lot. It came up in a discussion with friends and I've loved it so much. And I've thought about this idea of what if my burden is seeing myself in all the negative ways? That is a burden, isn't it? Not seeing my divine nature, not understanding how much he loves me in spite of my flaws. He loves me as I am today, even though my ideal for me is nowhere near where I am. And in my eyes, I'm failing. In his eyes, he loves me and he appreciates when I try. And for me, for the longest time, trying was a bad word. <laughs> you know, it's um, kind of um, do or do not. There is no try, <laughs> um, which I still love and find a lot of beauty in. But striving is so good. And he loves effort. The Lord loves effort, right? I'm just, I'm trying to get these thoughts in my head. So darkness, um, uh, darkness is what we feel so often. Darkness encourages those thoughts, that negativity. And, and I often don't see myself for who I am. And that is a burden. So what if I were to lay that burden at his feet and switch out my burden for his and his burden is light a light that is illuminating and helps me to see who i am and see how he sees me wouldn't that be an easier yoke and a lighter burden it's still difficult because it requires me exercising faith right anyway just a thought that i wanted to share with my friends because it's on my mind and I'm still trying to figure it out at some point it'll probably move toward okay now it's a fire you know I still when I read that scripture about Isaiah uh, and taking the coal you know and wanting it to touch his lips so that it, you know it's I'm like mm, no <laughs> it's too much for me but at some point maybe I'll be ready for you know that kind of refining just not yet However, I do have to speak Sunday on peace in Christ. So if anybody wants to share thoughts, experiences, ideas, I just have so much rolling around in my head. So if you want to share, you can share. <laughs> it'll just be part of my preparation for whatever it is that I'm supposed to share. Anyway, thank you for bearing with me today, being patient with all of my sharing, all my oversharing. Thank you, Linnell, for such a beautiful, beautiful ending, too. I appreciate you all. I'm grateful for my friends. Thank you for supporting me, too. <laughs> Hopefully you feel support from one another. And here is that picture that Linnell referenced. That beautiful idea, again, of all of us being lights for each other and looking out and knowing that we're not alone. Thanks for being here.